This is our, our last talk, um, Embracing Uncertainty, How Society Deals with Not Knowing in, our, uh, in Engineering, uh, Policy and uh, Climate Science. Uh, this talk is less on the climate science uh, or economics and more a cross-disciplinary uh, way of interconnecting some of the topics we've heard about, uh, we've heard this week. Uh, so I'll touch on a couple of uh, things that you might have heard before uh, and try to, uh, to tie them in together and then uh, finally uh, give a little bit of open discussion uh, with all you guys uh, to, to see what we have learned and what we can uh, maybe implement uh, in our communities. A few words to myself. My name is Christoph Tries. I'm a first year's master's student in the technology and policy program, uh, just as Emil. Uh, my background is uh, in engineering management. I did a bachelor's in Germany. Um, and uh, I, ha I do not have five years of experience working in the field uh, as, as Emil has. And that was really a wonderful presentation. I was amazed uh, by, by all the, by the insights and knowledge you, you shared with us. Um, I do, however, uh, study uh, decision-making under uncertainty as a research assistant uh, at the Joint Program since uh, uh, last September. And uh, so in the last semester, I've taken a couple of courses on uh, decision-making under uncertainty uh, and, uh, well, incorporating uncertainty in, uh, in power systems projects. And I'd like to share some of those experiences, uh, some of those uh, insights I've gained um, and connect them with other uh, uh, pieces uh, I've picked up at, at talks here and there, uh, share them with you, and then maybe engage in discussions afterwards. Uh, the agenda for my talk, uh, first, introduction to uncertainty, uh, a, few, uh, a few definitions, uh, so we actually know what we talk or not talk about. Um, a recap of uncertainty in climate science, uh, then the forecast is always wrong, uh, I'll get to uh, to what that exactly means uh, uh, later, um, and decision-making on uncertainty in engineering and policy. So these four uh, first uh, uh, topic or uh, um, uh, sections will be under the assumptions that we know climate change is happening, um, we don't uh, doubt the, the facts that, uh, that are and have been presented, um, but in the fifth one, communicating climate science to the public, I'd like to take a step back and actually uh, face one of the challenges that we in fact do face. Uh, Emil touched on that there's really political, uh, uh, well, there's, it's really tough to get uh, legislation passed. This is not only because the economics is, is tricky and incentives are not always uh, right, uh, rightly aligned, which is definitely a big part, but also a big part is our public perception. And so we're going to touch on that in the end. Um, the object objectives, what you should take away from, uh, from this talk. First, recap what are the big uh, fields of uncertainty in climate science. Um, second, recognize uncertainty as every day and everywhere, because it actually is all around us, not only in climate change, um, uh, but in all the other fields that we face in our, in our daily lives and in our uh, uh, professions. Third, uh, learn about examples of decision making under uncertainty, so accepting that we do face uncertainty everywhere and every day, uh, how can we actually uh, make smart decisions and uh, not just throw our hands up in the air and say, well, we don't know, so we can basically do anything. Um, and uh, finally and lastly, uh, think about and discuss how uncertainty uh, in climate science can be effectively communicated to the general public. I think that could be a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, I'd like to share some of my uh, uh, my, my thoughts and, and uh, uh, learning piece and bits and also hear from you. Um, what are your, uh, uh, what's your uh, impression? So, introduction to uncertainty. Uh, a wordle. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things you could, uh, uh, you could uh, connect with uncertainty. Uh, deep uncertainty, planning, adaptation, pathways, uh, climates up there on the left. <laughs> So we do have that. Um, but what we actually talk about is, uh, so a couple of definitions first, um, and we'll see that there's a lot of definitions on uncertainty out there, uh, which actually uh, brings us to a lot of problems, uh, also especially in climate science. Um, first of all, uncertainty and risk is always presented as a pair. Um, so in the public, risk is usually negatively connotated. It's something you want to avoid, something that will hurt you, and uncertainty is basically we don't like it, but it's not necessarily positive or negatively uh, connotated. 
Um, a very old definition by Frank Ra uh, Knight from 1921. Um, he sees risk as the measurable aspect of uncertainty. So basically, a known probability distribution of a uh, event. So we're not going to know uh, uh, what will actually happen. Uh, will it rain tomorrow or will it not rain? But we might be able to say, well, it's a 40% chance to rain, 60% chance that it does not rain. So we face good risk. And uncertainty, in his uh, understanding, is not measurable. Uh, in other contexts, that's referred to as deep uncertainty. Um, so uh, we can actually not put numbers to that. Uh, in the financial industry, uh, it's often um, connected with uh, that risk actually has an effect on, effect on your objective. So whatever you're trying to achieve, uh, the risk uh, uh, regarding that uh, is the uncertainty that actually uh, has an effect on your objective function or on, on your goal, what you're trying to achieve. Um, so yet another area, yet another definition of risk and uncertainty. Um, a, I want to say rather, uh, uh, it's not connected to a special area, but uh, the differences between aleatoric and epistemic uh, uncertainty is aleatoric is statistical uh, uncertainty. So basically, um, minor variations to the starting conditions. As an example, well, the Super Bowl is on Sunday, so uh, you know, with, in football practice, they have these machines that throw the football out uh, straight away, and you could probably. Uh, put that machine uh, in a certain way that uh, it would have this, uh, put the football on the same trajectory every single time. However, there's little variations, maybe some turbulences in the air, uh, or um, that we uh, that the football in the material actually in, at, at, on one side is unnoticeably thinner, that actually will lead to the football not having the exact same trajectory, but a tiny bit of a different trajectory. And these are when we categorize this as aleatoric uh, uncertainty, um, this actually means that we cannot measure. So it might be thinner, but it's so uh, so little, uh, so uh, so little that it's actually unmeasurable for us. So obviously, we like to get better at our measurements, and then we can sort of uh, move the boundary between epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty. Um, but for these concepts, uh, aleatoric cannot be measured. On the other hand, epistemic uncertainty is sort of a systematic uncertainty. It's maybe that we neglect an effect. For example, the uh, the uh, the air fri the friction of the of the air onto the onto the ball. If we basically build a model and want to predict where the ball lands, the football, um, and we don't account for the friction, then we will be wrong every single time. But taking that into account and including that in our model would uh, would allow us to to actually well uh, have better results. So. Um, a final distinction between uh, levels of uncertainty, uh, also just one of many that are out there. Um, between determinism, we know perfectly what's going to happen, and total ignorance, we have no idea, so-called deep, deep uncertainty, or uh, uh, there's a couple names for it. Um, might be on, on level one, we have sort of a point forecast, we know where it's going, it's, it's, it's one forecast, um, we're pretty sure that's going to happen. Level two, there's a couple scenarios. Um, that we think maybe have a probability, that we can uh, have a fair, uh, uh, well, for, we trust that one of those scenarios will, uh, will, will take place. Level three uncertainty is we have a range, but we can't actually pinpoint uh, what exact uh, uh, element of that range will, uh, will take effect. Uh, and the fourth one, the deep uncertainty, we know basically there is something that will happen, but well, basically, in which direction that ball is going to move, we have no idea. And obviously, total ignorance uh, is the further step. So we see uncertainty um, has a lot of different uh, uh, connotations. And especially once we move into uncertainty in climate science, uh, we'll see that that actually has practical difficulties when we uh, try, to, uh, uh, try to make climate policy. Um, and uh, yes, when we, for example, make climate policy. So, important distinction, this was a disclaimer from the beginning. We assume that uh, we don't question whether climate change is real or not, but we, uh, we are uncertain about how the exact, or what, what, the, what the magnitudes or what the specific effects of climate change are. Um, this is a recap from uh, Justin Maduro uh, yesterday, I presented this graph already. So we have, uh, 
<coughs> we have, uh, this is a classic model, you've probably seen that or in similar graphs before, uh, where we, uh, the, the global temperature mean that's going to rise due to climate change over the years, and the different uh, uh, shaded areas are the uncertain ranges that we know, uh, or we assume that the global mean temperature rise is going to be at. So we have this uh, orange rise here. It's the internal, internal variability. Dust, uh, Justin uh, uh, explained that as it's basically uh, this phenomenon is like El Nino, La Nina. Uh, climate just uh, is not really, we cannot predict the weather for tomorrow just as we cannot predict the climate for, uh, for the next uh, couple of decades. So we see this stays pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty straight uh, forward, does not really go spread out over the years. That's the internal variability. We have model spread. That's our models. They, if we look at different models, they are calibrated a little differently. They might, uh, Justin talked about the, uh, basically the, the clouds uh, or the, uh, this, these, uh, um, the cubes basically that we divide the earth into. They might have different sizes. They might have a little bit of different uh, 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 assumptions of how uh, the, the effects from one uh, of, these, uh, of these cubes transfer to another cube. So between our models, we have a certain spread and don't know exactly where we're going to land. And we actually see the most variability over time uh, in our uh, representative concentration paths, RCPs, of, uh, of CO2 emissions or of, of greenhouse gases in general. Um, basically, we can say how much climate policy our, our nations, our countries going to, to implement. If there's a lot of policies, we'll likely be on one of those uh, paths. If there's no policy at all and we just uh, keep uh, adding more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we're going to end up up here. But we really can't say at this point uh, which of these actual actions humans will take. So all of these factors um, together give us a pretty big spread of uncertainty. So we're actually not able to predict uh, what the climate will, will be like at the end of the century. Um, here. Also recap a definitely incomplete list of causes of uncertainty. We've uh, gone over the climate cycles and Nino Enya, uh, one of the big hot topics in climate science uh, in, the, in, the, in the science part is aerosol radiation. How do clouds form? Um, the, the, just the, the scientific processes are not really understood yet. So uh, that's a big and actually uh, understanding them better uh, will en enable us to get rid of some of the from some of these epistemic uncertainties uh, that we that we can see that uh, there's some effects, but we can't really quantify it yet. So that's that's one area of research to kind of reduce that uncertainty spread in the future. And we've also talked about climate negotiations. Um, there's actually studies who try to predict the outcome of uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, uh, maybe not surprisingly, they didn't really find really good results with the model they used. But it's uh, it's one of the most complex issues to to actually predict. Um, regarding climate science and climate change. Um, also, other, uh, other reasons why we have some sort of deep two course time steps. Uh, we maybe basically just go in, uh, in entire years in many models. Um, two course spatial resolution, we talked about that we're down to 110 kilometers, I think, for these, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, sides of the spheres in our model, in our climate models, but obviously that could uh, and should uh, be, be much closer to get better results. Um, Representation of feedbacks are not uh, not complete. Um, climate variables uh, are maybe observation uh, uh, observation um, difficulties uh, with our uh, climate monitors, etc. Unknown no unknowns that we actually have not even discovered that uh, that there's uncertainty. There's uncertainty that uh, we cannot even attribute to, to certain things. So. Um, in the ICCP uh, reports, um, uncertainty plays a big role, obviously, and I think, um, but there has been a lot of progress in uh, trying to get together these definitions of uncertainty or uh, to, to actually agree on one definition of uncertainty uh, uh, regarding climate change, uh, at least on this very expert uh, group that's sort of at the forefront uh, and, and considered the, the sort of uh, the, the leading uh, the panel of uh, of communication on climate change. So, in the uh, uh, just as an example, in the assessment report number four, uh, we had likelihood uh, as one measure of uncertainty, which was just the chance of happening of an event. 
uh, judged quantitatively by experts that just gave values of 1 to 10 uh, to those uh, events. It's not that bad of a measurement. Those experts actually do understand quite a lot about what they, uh, what they are judging. Um, nonetheless, putting a quantitative, as we'll later see, uh, uh, number on it does not uh, really make a lot of sense. Uh, second measure was confidence. It was the uh, <coughs> degree of consensus on the expert statements. So how confident are we that the expert statements are right? Uh, it's like a, a double uh, uh, um, measurement. Also quantitatively as a probability uh, uh, assigned. And they had a third rather qualitative approach. So the different working groups on the assessment report number four um, uh, used different combinations of those uncertainty uh, uh, definitions. So one example, uh, one working group only used the likelihood, one uh, used a combination of, of both, and I'm not really sure uh, what the third uh, working group was working on, but even inside the IPCC there was not, not an agreement. They had formulated those uh, definitions of uncertainty, but the different groups uh, had not really coordinated to, to speak with one voice. What are the years of the AR4 and the AR5? Uh, AR4 was 2007, I believe. Please correct me. Uh, and AR5 was uh, recently in 2015. Okay. Yeah. Um, AR5. Uh, so from AR4 to AR5, there was a lot of thought. They saw this as a problem that they had to fix because um, with the uncertainty, people couldn't really work with the uncertainty uh, uh, values that were given to. Uh, let's say uh, the what's how how much sea level level is going to rise or uh, or other effects that were um, uh, that were portrayed or came out, out of, as results out of the assessment report. So for the AR5, the old concept of uh, confidence was thrown out, um, and a new concept of confidence was now the validity of the finding um, on a qualitative scale. So uh, they said, well, this quantitative approach up here didn't didn't really help us. Um, so the validity of the finding is basically um, does the finding in our uh, in our report actually match what's what's happening. So um, it's sort of the, the th truth truth statement of uh, of the findings, and uh, it was basically embraced on a five point scale, not not points, but from very low to very high, and just by the sheer not putting numbers on it. Uh, was the idea that, that you don't give people the impression that's that's actually uh, on a on a scale that maybe two is uh, double as uh, double the value of one, but by putting it in this qualitative way, you had a better grip on on the uncertainty or made better inferences. And uh, the likelihood was then the probabilistic uh, measure of uncertainty uh, in the findings. So here you did have a quantitative, and I think uh, most of you have seen that um, on the next slide. The likelihood scales. Um, the how certain uh, uh, what the probability of certain outcomes are uh, are then from these very nice probabilistic percentages transferred back into uh, these very uh, stereotypical or these uh, uh, these terms that you might have uh, read on the reports that first it was likely then in the AR5 report it was very likely um, so. Yeah, that's basically, that, that was the move from AR4 to AR5. Um, even, as a side note, even AR5 is not conceptually uh, perfect. So there has been some criticism on the, on the definitions of uncertainty in the AR5 report. Uh, one study I have um, found on that was Avon and, uh, and Ren, who uh, basically looked at the report, were not satisfied, and, and started their own. Uh, or propose a different, uh, a different conception, a different framework to, to actually cover uncertainty. Um, uh, they are, uh, as an example, they, uh, they suggested that the, the strength of knowledge should be assessed, so not only a probability, so you could say this event has 20% chance of happening, um, and this event has 40% chance of happening, but uh, important is also how much data do you have to back it up, so you might be really sure you have a lot of data uh, for the 20% uh, uh, chance of sea level rise above, uh, uh, above uh, 20 centimeters, but you might not have a lot of data to support if hurricanes uh, actually occur or not. So um, what they suggested and was 
what surprisingly uh, uh, was was missing so far was some measurement of how how valid actually uh, those uh, those probability uh, attributions are. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of work uh, remaining. So AR6 hopefully will have a better, uh, more coherent approach to to uh, quali quantifying and qualifying uncertainty. Um, but this, uh, as we'll see later, at the, at the expert level, um, there's uh, this disagreement uh, will then only trickle down uh, to, to what we get into to later. So, partial summary of the, of the first two uh, sections. We have different conceptions and classifications of uncertainty. Um, even though among, among the experts, there's, there's no agreement. So, um, yeah, basically uh, what I, I just told you. Um, and uh, there is a really a push to, to uh, have a coherent coher methodolog methodology uh, for, uh, for quantifying uncertainty. The forecast is always wrong. Um, this is the title of a, um, of a lecture by Professor De Neuville, uh, who's in the uh, IDSS, Institute for Data Systems and Society. Uh, I've taken the, uh, his class uh, last semester, and uh, the following slides are, basic, uh, are based uh, on a lot of uh, the examples he is bringing in his class. And uh, what I want to get across here is we face uncertainty every day and everywhere. Uh, for example, uh, if uh, we look at airport runways, uh, you might think paving a new airport runway, uh, putting, uh, taking the old asphalt uh, off, putting new asphalt on, pretty simple task. You should be able to project pretty, uh, pretty well how much uh, that's going to cost. Um, this study uh, is actually uh, shows us that the, it varies quite a lot from almost half of the, uh, of the expected cost to more than two and a half times what they uh, suggested, uh, uh, what they first projected as the cost. Um, so even in these basically simple uh, 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 manual tasks, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we project something, but uh, in the end, it'll turn out much, much differently. Um, actual projected power use in the US, uh, these are so-called porcupine graph. Um, these are projections in different years. Uh, and here's the actual uh, 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 power use in the US. So even though they kind of, they, they maybe should have figured out by the fourth or the fifth uh, projection that uh, it was not going to keep growing uh, the way they were uh, planning or they were assuming, um, nonetheless, these uh, very smart, uh, uh, these very smart people, that's uh, actually from the, um, from the uh, International Energy Agency, if I'm not mistaken. So even at these uh, very high level organizations, uh, they're not able to make right, uh, correct predictions. NASA project uh, cost growth. Um, these are just uh, different NASA projects. Here's the standard deviation and the average. Um, ratio of actual to estimated cost. So uh, the one would be a good project. So this was kind of, this was not as bad. Uh, but obviously, there are a lot of projects that just shoot way over budget. Um, obviously, there might be uh, uh, incentives for that. Uh, you know, you have a constrained budget. You try to uh, first get the project through uh, by pushing in a lower budget. Uh, but still, it's uh, quite remarkable how how, the, how big the, the actual results differ from what we expect. Um, well, copper prices this is one of my favorite. Um, they really try to. Here they shoot, uh, they shoot too high, now we're going to go, go low, suck, <laughs> uh, uh, didn't make it, or we have to go high, oh, we were too low. Uh, so really, uh, there's, not those, uh, there's not a very good, uh, this is actually a Chilean copper mine that predicted those copper prices. Um, they should actually know their business, uh, you would think. But, um, so there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in, in the world around us that we cannot predict. Uh, coming back to the forecast is always wrong. U.S. wind energy installations uh, have been consistently uh, judged as too low. Um, these are the, the projections and uh, the, the bar on the right, the darker bar is what actually was installed. Same type of, uh, same idea. Um, and even in our politics, uh, election polls, um, uh, we might think, um, so this is, uh, we all know that they were wrong. Um, but if you, uh, if you think about it, uh, actually, it should not surprise us uh, that they were wrong because uh, what we actually, so let me, let me back up for a second. So these, uh, these uh, 
These are all point forecasts. We forecast one value for 2006, one value for 2008. Here, we have point forecasts. These are like the, the blue points, blue and red points, but we also have a range. So the point forecasts, which basically we said, all right, Clinton's going to win uh, all these states, and Trump's only going to win a couple, and we have a new president, the first uh, female president of the United States. Uh, turned out the point forecasts were terrible. They were wrong. But actually, if we look at the margin, uh, this in, in the lectures before that Justin gave, we had these, uh, basically the whiskers that are more common statistical representation. This from 538, Nate Solver's site. Uh, he's a little more, I want to say, uh, trying to communicate to a broader public. So uh, these are the 80% confidence intervals. 80% is not that high. Usually we use 95 or, or even higher intervals in, uh, uh, in other contexts. Um, but in every single state, his 80% confidence interval was right. So um, if we take into account the, the larger, uh, the, not the point forecasts, but actually uh, a distribution of forecasts, uh, we, are, we are pretty good at predicting what's going to happen. So um, rephrasing on the title of, the, of, the, uh, of this section, um, it's not the forecast that's always wrong, but it's the point forecast that's always wrong. And we should really try and refrain from, uh, from putting too much weight on the point forecasts. Um, still not working. Um, so the fourth section, uh, decision making under uncertainty in engineering and policy. So we've seen a couple examples how uh, the forecasts, uh, at least the point forecasts, do not work out. Um, there is ways, though, um, how in engineering, uh, in our economy, in, uh, in uh, policy um, uh, adaption, uh, in, in policy making, how we are able to deal with these uncertain futures. One example, recognizing the uncertainty as its uncertainty. So basically going from the point forecast to, uh, to the distributed forecasts. Um, the concept of expected value is very important. It's uh, used in many uh, um, basically managerial uh, profitability studies. Uh, you don't forecast a uh, one, per, one, one perfect uh, um, profitability of your firm or your, uh, your new, new, new product, but uh, use expected, expected value so you have a range of different um, demand forecasts. And uh, it is very important, the flaw of averages, you have actually, you can't just take the average of all your, your demand forecasts that you're given and calculate uh, your profitability or your profit once with those, this average. Um, because the expected profit, so the profitability based on the average forecast, if I have a set of forecasts and average them to one number to the point forecast, is not equal to what I get if I take the entire average, so the distribution of uh, what I assume to be uh, the correct projection, uh, and basically do the calculations, maybe if, if, the, uh, if, the, if the forecast has 100 different, uh, different, uh, different forecasts, I have to do calculations 100 times, but I'll get uh, a, a much more correct uh, answer than when I only use the average. Um, this is the so-called flaw of averages, um, this phenomenon that I, I actually get different values uh, using one or the other uh, technique, um, and is an important concept to, to recognize. Uh, and actually, it is being recognized and implemented in, uh, in ministerial decision making, but not as widespread as, as, uh, as one would think. So it's still really uh, a push to, to get this idea out there, uh, to actually implement it in the field. It takes a little more computational power. It takes more effort for the individuals working in firms uh, to, to well, this, this concept of a distributed forecast to, to actually work with that. Uh, but it does get better results. Um, and uh, maybe one side note also, uh, if we have the point forecast, it's basically also a distribution, just a distribution that has only one value and says this is 100%. So um, whenever we get a we get a range and uh, we just get a much better picture of uh, of our distribution, much better resolution. Um, the second, uh, basically, uh, technique of, of decision making under uncertainty is to uh, incorporate flexibility. Uh, and this, if you know you have a certain range of uncertain outcomes, uh, if you have a range of uncertain outcomes. Um, you uh, can actually uh, use that to your advantage. This is an example from a uh, uh, skyscraper in Chicago um, built by a medical company. Uh, so I don't, I don't have a picture from before, but they only built first uh, to, uh, to, this, 
to this floor uh, and stopped. And then this is a, a picture of when it was under construction. So for, for a couple of years, it was just, just this lower part here because they didn't know where they're going to grow, was the economy going to be good, was it going to be bad. Um, but they did build the, the foundations of the building uh, strong enough to support another 10, 15 stories on top. So uh, uh, a couple of years later, when they decided, all right, we're really going to, I'm not sure if the exact situation stay in Chicago or if the economy is good, we're growing, they decided to, uh, uh, to make their uh, skyscraper a bit bigger and actually capitalized on this uncertainty. So at the beginning, they weren't sure uh, what the, uh, which path they're going to be on. Are we going to be low climate or high climate? Uh, and then they decided uh, when they knew, when over time it, uh, they pretty much knew uh, uh, what path it was, they decided to upgrade. So what we can take from this lesson for, for, climate, uh, uh, for climate change is actually for climate change uh, adaptation. If we have to adapt to, uh, to the, we will have some climate change uh, at least, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's no doubt. So, until, uh, so basically building projects that uh, take into account um, uh, or that, that have the possibility to, to capture on this uh, uncertainty once it becomes known. Um, for example, uh, in the uh, project I'm working on, it's a hydropower project in Africa. So the idea is to first uh, build the dam uh, and build a lot of caverns where we can put, uh, where, where we can put uh, uh, generators but not put in all the generators because they're really expensive because we don't know how much water we're going to have. Once uh, climate change becomes known, if, it's, uh, uh, if we're on the high climate uh, or if we're on the low climate change, meaning uh, uh, wetter climate, or high climate change, meaning drier climate, once we know which path we're on, uh, the company or the, uh, the government in that case can decide to put more generators in the already uh, basically uh, uh, built caverns. That's an analogy to the, the foundation of the, of the skyscraper just have, that has to be strong in the beginning to later then uh, support a larger structure. Um, so basically, Zambia and Zimbabwe, uh, the governments are thinking about this hydropower plant. Um, the idea is that they will, uh, in 20 years, for example, decide if they want to uh, uh, make their uh, put more generators into their hydropower and actually uh, if they have enough water at that time. And if, if they don't, they, uh, they will not build too big. You could, yes. Okay. Um, so that is uh, rec recognizing uncertainty and introducing flexibility are uh, measures that are fairly, fairly, uh, uh, or starting to be more common in uh, engineering, engineer managerial backgrounds, but uh, there's a hope that these could also be applied to climate, uh, climate uh, adapt adaptation. And finally, um, Decision-making under uncertainty in policy, similar idea. Uh, we have uh, an uncertain future. We don't know what path we're going to be on. But we, we, we can uh, make so-called adaptive policy making. That, that means we design policies and uh, later re-evaluate them, depending on which uh, path turns out to be the one we're, uh, uh, that the world is on. Um, a sort of uh, uh, necessary for that is knowledge assessment. Uh, with the climate, it's rather easy because uh, we'll just uh, we'll have a thermometer that tells us how much our global mean temperature has risen. Um, but there's a lot of other issues that you, where you actually, if you dig down to, to discover uh, what you're uncertain, uh, uh, what, uh, what the state of the world is that you're in, you can then actually make decisions and, and capitalize on or decide uh, uh, what the re-evaluation of the policy should look like. Um, one, uh, one example uh, for that, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, uh, I'm blanking right here. Oh, uh, one example of that is the uh, aviation industry in the U.S., uh, where the Federal Aviation uh, Agency um, actually uh, deployed a group that, is, uh, uh, that investigates near misses of, of planes. So um, once they kind of find out what, uh, what might cause uh, accidents uh, of airplanes, uh, so this knowledge assessment approach, they can then modify the, the safety standards of those airplanes. So the safety standards are, not, are now not put very stringent, uh, but you have a very close eye on uh, what goes wrong or what is almost what going wrong, those near misses, to then better inform uh, how to, how to re-evaluate the policy and, and actually make the regulation as stringent as, as necessary 
uh, but, uh, but as lenient as possible. Um, and uh, another great point, uh, which uh, when I was listening to uh, the talk, uh, the lecture that Mihao gave on economics and policy, sometimes the COVID benefits of climate, uh, cl climate science action might actually uh, be greater than uh, what we're actually trying uh, uh, to do. Uh, we're trying to combat climate change and putting in a policy, uh, but we're not really convincing anybody that it's going to be in the social interest. Um, but for example, uh, uh, Germany was uh, investing heavily in the solar industry, and a co-benefit was that uh, for at least for uh, for about a decade, they were leading the solar industry, and actually a lot of companies profited off of that. So uh, these might be also considerations when you talk about climate policy. Uh, not always be too focused on what is this policy doing for climate change, uh, but there's lots and lots of co-benefits, and uh, those might actually be enough to to push a really good policy through. Um, partial summary for this part, um, before we go into the last uh, section. Um, uncertainty is every day and everywhere. Uh, and uh, there is actually tools that are already developed and that are further developed that actually allow us to, to uh, make use of that, uh, that uncertainty, not throw our hands up in the air. And actually, uh, obviously, if you're running a business uh, or if you're um, planning a climate adaptation uh, strategy, uh, and you take the if you take the point forecast, it might look great because you don't account for all the negative uh, uh, climate uh, climate uh, uh, turns that the uh, negative turns that the climate could take. Um, but you're actually just wrong. So realizing, uh, recognizing the uncertainty and introducing then the flexibility uh, uh, will actually be a great uh, uh, or is is hoped to be a, a of great use for climate adaptation policies. Now. Community uncertainty in climate science to the public. Uh, we leave our nice world where we all know that climate change is happening, and we enter the age of denial. Um, it's a term I'm not uh, exactly sure uh, where it originates from. It's, uh, it's used by, by a variety of uh, people and authors. Um, the idea is that we live in an age where, uh, and you've heard most of those uh, words before, close factual words, alternative facts is the new, uh, uh, new hot topic there. Um, doubt might be used to cast, uh, so basically doubt is cast on, uh, on the results of uh, climate science research um, in order to, uh, to then block climate change policies. Um, the edge of denial is actually um, is something that has to be, if, if you want to, to combat climate, is something we have to, to accept and we have to tackle and, and see how we can actually overcome it. And um, we were listening to, um, I was listening to a great talk by Deborah Bloom, who's uh, in the uh, night science uh, journalism uh, group here at MIT. She was giving a talk in one of her classes, and she talked about her role as a science journalist, sort of bridging that gap from climate scientist to the general public. And uh, it, was, uh, it was great to hear from her. She, uh, she's a very... Um, um, very experienced uh, uh, woman in her, in her field. She's won a Pulitzer Prize, um, and so what? What she was saying is, uh, uh, she really takes on that role, and she is researching uh, the science papers, both, uh, for example, those that uh, find climate change as a uh, as a fact, and those that, uh, in their uh, the few research uh, uh, findings that that are out there that that deny climate change, and she tries to really uncover uh, what they say. Mitigate uh, uh, if there's really complicated uh, wording on uncertainty in the IPCC report, for example. She has the role, or it's, it's her view, to then communicate that to the general public in terms of words that they can understand. Uh, and well, let's be honest, uh, uh, all of us are part of the general public, at least in in some areas. Um, maybe in climate change, one uh, one or the other of us uh, uh, is rather in the expert group. Uh, but in a lot of topics, we also belong to the general public, or we just do not have the, the knowledge to, to understand what experts uh, are in detail talking about. Um, so how can, uh, the big question that Deborah Bloom uh, is asking, uh, how she can actually bridge or help bridge that gap to, between scientists and, and the public. And um, one, one final piece uh, of, um, or maybe uh, uh, point of uh, uh, where, where thoughts could begin. Uh, is this model, uh, which is from a uh, study, 
actually from a from a working group on communicating uncertainty um, to uh, to the end user. So it is uh, it is about climate uncertainty, uh, and it is um, think enough that there's services that can be offered around climate uh, climate change, climate adaptation. Um, but there's large uncertainty, and you have an end user, basically uh, the general public. You can also see here uh, the public and the media. And you have the providers who uh, are measurement simulations. This is maybe where some of the folks at the drug program sit, uh, the experts who, who have uh, constructed the models, who, uh, who take the observations uh, from, uh, from climate balloons, run them through the models, and, and try to inform uh, and let all the other people uh, uh, in this sort of chain know uh, what, uh, what the climate is going to look like. And, and this, for example, um, yeah, so uh, you could think of uh, there's some processing in between and then uh, the climate information has to be formed into a product by, uh, by a firm uh, that, that is offering it to the end user. You could also Take this. And that's what I think. Uh, take this. Um, uh, take this uh, um, uh, chart or this uh, uh, this figure, uh, and apply it to how we communicate about climate science in general. Because uh, we have the end users who we try to convince uh, um, of uh, the fact that climate change is happening, and that we need to 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 um, to develop uh, climate policy, and providers. Uh, the research experts uh, at the universities at MIT, for example, uh, have a long way uh, between them. So um, what we actually need are these, all these different uh, intermediaries. Journalists could, could be one of them. Um, because the public uh, is just, uh, in, our, in our world, it's, uh, it is so, I want to say, topics are so complex, uh, or we've gotten so specialized that the topics have gotten so complex that we as the end user, in most times, cannot actually um, uh, understand all the all the uh, hit, like tiny tiny bit of variations, um, which the experts uh, are really key in on. Because a policy, depending on whether you you structure it a little bit different, might have large uh, largely different effects. So um, we need, I think, uh, these different uh, intermediaries, uh, where we have from the experts to the public, uh, sort of an abstraction of the information, but at the same time. Uh, uh, making it more available to people. Um, so, if you take out if you take out these uh, uh, these sort of intermediaries, uh, as for example, um, uh, I would believe uh, the um, basically the war on the media, who who are one of the major uh, intermediaries that we have nowadays. So, if we take out the media that sort of uh, are able to be experts, but uh, but sort of be a link between the experts, understand what the experts are talking about, and then rephrase it uh, for our end user. Uh, if we take that out, um, we're going to have a really hard time uh, to actually make smart decisions because uh, there's just not not a good communication going on between the general public and and the experts. Um, yes, so that uh, was what I wanted to uh, share with you today. Um, thank you for listening so far. Uh, I would be, uh, I'm happy to, to take questions or some of your um, uh, views on how uh, climate, uh, how we can communicate uh, climate science to, uh, to the public, for example. Yes, please. Um, I think about this in the context of of an often, you know, often heard statement that people make decisions um, in a lot of ways primarily more from emotion than from fact. And uh, thinking about ways that I've heard uncertainty communicated through, for instance, stories or other kind of emotional uh, means. Carrie Emanuel wrote an amazing article a few years ago about, you know, tail risk and like, if your child had a 1% chance of being hit walking across the street, you know, would you let them? Because <laughs> that's the sort of risk that we're taking with climate. I was wondering if you had any perspective coming from, you know, the kind of academic uncertainty uh, world about um, emotional or storytelling ways to get risk across. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, storytelling is, uh, 
is extremely vital if you want to uh, to get people around an idea. Um, and especially if we're talking about policy, policy is nothing else than getting people around ideas. Um, maybe not the general public, but at least the, the congressmen, and they have to sell it then uh, to their constituents. So um, I would agree that, that storytelling can, can go a long way. Um, however, with storytelling, uh, it's a, uh, I don't know how you call it, the, the, uh, a knife of two sides, because uh, you can also make a lot of great stories that uh, do not, uh, well, what, uh, do not uh, actually hold in it the truth that we, what we, or what we consider the truth. But it actually would uh, would would encourage uh, the opposite action. So um, yeah, I don't know. Nathaniel. I just wanted to make a quick comment, kind of along those lines too, which is sort of uh, it's something I think that you touched on throughout your uh, presentation, but sort of the psychological impact of uncertainty and the psycho like the psychology of how you communicate to the public or other scientists. Um, like storytelling is good, and it's a good motivator from the emotional side. But you also have to be very careful. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, off the top of my head, um, like the IPCC phrasing for the various uncertainty points of that chart that you had in the beginning, uh, I remember seeing a study a couple of years back which demonstrated that people's perception of the numbers underlying those phrases was actually wildly different than what the IPCC intended. And that's not even going into storytelling, that's a very cut and dry factual thing where you have yeah. to table. That's good. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, thinking about a different uh, way to motivate people, uh, I've heard that like insurance actuarials are already factoring in climate change, or at least flooding into certain housing markets. Yes. And you know, people pay attention to what they spend, and I wonder if there's other ways that before things actually happen, they'll be priced in, uh, and people will get that sort of thing. Um, well, speaking of the housing market, I can just think of one example where it really didn't work that uh, uh, when the housing market uh, here in the US crashed and, and uh, brought forth the financial crisis. So I think um, I think we cannot always trust that uh, things will be priced in. Um, however, there's definitely, I, I guess there's a good argument to be made that, uh, that more things are, because we just have a much broader perception with uh, uh, with our uh, digital communication means, we can be much aware of m many more uh, uh, things occurring um, that, and then actually uh, well, price them in or uh, adjust our actions uh, to them. So as a general point, yes, I guess that will be, I'm not aware of, off the top of my head, um, examples where, where I remember that. Yes? Just a comment from, um I fall on that spectrum on the end user, and what I'd like to do in my community is, you know, kind of move into maybe an end user uh, where I'm able to translate some of that information. And what I find all of, all of the time is that um, people will turn off when they hear negative information that feels hopeless. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in communicating these things, it has to um, come across, at least by the time you get to the end user, as there are things that can be done, and there are ways that we can work with the problem. Uh, because as soon as people hear it's overwhelming, it's too late, they give up. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, I, and I think you should, um, you know, look to encourage people all along the way. You know, some people who are close to the science and people, you know, uh, closer to the end user to make that communication and, and to be informed. And I just want to thank you for having this um, series of talks. It's been helpful to me. That's great here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, one, uh, yeah, I'd like to, to add a little bit onto that. Um, so I believe giving people something to actually do makes them, uh, well, feel that they can make a difference. So even though um, uh, it might make, maybe not be the best solution to do right now, uh, as we heard from Emil, second best solution, if it's anything that people can actually do and, and act right away, that'll help them, them get around and rally and maybe go to the next phase, become the end user, maybe the end minus one. Um, so I agree, I agree with that. And the second one, uh, second thought, important is to, to keep people from sort of shutting down and saying this is just too much for me. Um, I think one of my intentions with this talk was uh, the 
around the word uncertainty, uh, trying to, to open some of those blinds where people just, just shut down and, and say, well, uncertain, we, we don't know what, what's going to happen. We face uncertainty everywhere in our, in our world, and just realizing that just takes a lot of, or at least I believe uh, it, it can take a lot of the, sort of the, the strain, oh my god, we, we can't do anything about it, takes it from it. So, yeah, there were other, please. This is not so much about uncertainty, but, but it is about communication. And one thing that baffles me is we're, we're in America. Not everybody goes to MIT in America. And yet almost every time I see an article or hear a talk about climate change, the reference is to two degrees centigrade, which many people in America don't understand. And often you go through an entire newspaper article and there's no mention of what that's equivalent to in Fahrenheit. Do you know why? Great example. I mean, the reporters, it's not just scientists, it's, it's the reporters. It's, who it's yeah, one of the points, um, I didn't throw up here, but I, I, I might now. So we have, um, we get to have a, the barrier of vocabulary between those two, two sort of worlds. And climate scientists just do work in Celsius, cause, uh, and, and maybe Kelvin, because uh, uh, that's just how, how the, the, the scientific community decided to, to work with it. But also not realizing that the rest of, at least the country, um, it does, does, uh, does not, cannot follow that. Another great example, <laughs> we had yesterday in our talk, uh, positive and negative feedbacks. Um, the positive climate feedback was actually more warming. The negative climate feedback was, uh, was cooling. So, I mean, obviously uh, it does, from, from a scientific point, it makes absolute sense that positive is reinforcing, negative is uh, in the opposite direction. Um, but yeah, for the general public, it's just, uh, just confusing in a way. So, very, I, I, I agree with your point. Um, that's just a yeah something we have to, to work around. I think um, uh, it would be great to if journalists realize that they you know put in a little asterisk or a, a explanation out there for the U.S. change to to Celsius all together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. that's pretty hard with asking that. That's yeah. Uh, Eric. Uh, general public, you know, you have a certain population that believes it's a problem and a population that doesn't. And if you give them more data, their beliefs are a little more confirming of, of what they were before. But if you take kind of like academically, scientifically rigorous people who believe in climate change and those who do not, when you give them more data, their beliefs strengthen more in the direction they already were by a far greater degree. So you have these kind of like you know, uh, you know, educated people who may not believe in climate change, you give them more data and they, they believe their original beliefs even, even more strongly. So how do we reach those educated people? Um, so just personal uh, speculation and um, I think we can't. Um, I'm going to say my conception. <laughs> my conception is that uh, people presented with the same set of facts, will just come to different conclusions. Um, there, there's like convergence of, on, on similar conclusions that people can, can, uh, can come to, um, but, but I would believe uh, they don't all come to the same conclusion if you give them exactly the same, the same data. Um, just as if you look at this chart, you, everybody realizes a couple different words, uh, and some, some you might actually look at, some you might not, not look at. And um, so those people that we have not yet exposed that do not have a scientific background, so uh, they are still um, not really far along those paths where they get to, to a certain result. Um, so once we present them with the data, they'll actually then get on the path that, that they are sort of uh, uh, feeling. Um, but well, those that, that just are inclined to, to interpret the data in a different way, they'll just uh, keep them going further. I don't know, maybe that conception strings a chord here or there. <laughs>